So that would have made quite an entrance if I would indeed have tripped. So my talk will be about time. And when I was pacing up and down the hallway just a second ago, I was really thinking that these set of talks that I've now seen today are of a truly different nature. They've told us about how to cope with loss, how to aim for world peace, and all that I'm going to do is tell you about something fairly academic. Fairly academic, because I'm just going to talk about time, how time works in our brain. So, having set the expectations relatively low, <laughs> I still think that this is one of the most intriguing things that we can study about human cognition. Because timing is truly omnipresent. It ranges from microsecond timing. If I would catch a ball, I would need to see it, I would need to calculate when it would actually reach my hand, and I would need to instruct my muscles to actually reach out at the right point in time. And now that I'm walking here, and I, I was almost tripping earlier, the only reason that I didn't trip we, was because I could very quickly calculate what my muscles needed to do to actually stand on solid ground again. That's an amazing feat. Now, the other thing that we don't really realize about timing is that we all have our own internal clocks, our biological clocks. It's four or five in the afternoon, we're getting drowsy. You're getting hungry, irrespective of what's in your tummy. You're getting hungry because our system tells us it's about time to eat. Now, these two forms of timing are very implicit. We can't really control them. I will catch that ball. I will become hungry. But there's another form of timing that we can control, cognitive timing. And that's what I'm going to talk about mostly. We also call it interval timing. It's the timing in the milliseconds and seconds or minutes ranges. It's when you knew as a kid that if you would play hide and seek, there is a certain proper speed by which you needed to count. And this is a kind of timing that we also see almost everywhere. These are two pretty famous individuals that differ in many, many different ways. There are at least two things that they have in common. They were or are presidents of the United States, and both of them, even though in very, very different ways, are excellent timers. They're excellent rhetorical timers. They know when they need to pause for a bit, either to let everyone appreciate the wisdom of their statements, or let everyone get angry enough to start cheering. And you can yourself decide who I'm referring to with what statements. <laughs> but it's something that we actually do all day, all the time, and we actually do it in parallel. This is a scene of driving a car. While you're driving a car, you might have a conversation with someone sitting next to you. And is that silence that you're hearing now coming from this other person an indication of him or her just looking for a word? Or is it sort of like an invitation to take over the conversation? So that needs to be timed. But at the same time, you also need to time when you need to look again in your rear of your mirror. You need to time when it might be necessary to check your speed again. You need to time when you should check your navigational device. So that means that we can't just have a single stopwatch in our brain. We must be able to do a lot of timing at the same time. And this is actually something that we as kids already could do pretty well. Even very, very young babies are good timers. And that's very easy to tell from one of the first games that we can play with children. The peekaboo game. Peekaboo is nothing but temporal expectations. Parents hiding their face for their kids and going like, peek a -boo. <laughs> And the only reason why it's funny is that suddenly something appears and the, there's this buildup of expectation in the child. The great thing about all this timing is that it happens really, really implicitly. And what I'm going to do is show you a short commercial, a commercial for a French car. And I'm not going to tell you what it is about, a part, of course, that you know that there is something about time in here. Let's have a quick look.
grand modus, surtout à l'intérieur. So it's clear, this must be a huge car. Because there's no, no way that, let's have a look at it again. Here's the commercial, you see this car going. You see the couple sitting there, a happy couple. A cookie comes out, and you still don't know what you need to time. You're seeing the dog, you're even seeing her throw the cookie. And now somewhere your brain started going like, huh? Grand modus, surtout à l'intérieur. So the advertisement agency was sure enough of your cognitive skills that it was going to bet on it that you would time the moment that the woman would throw the cookie and that you would realize that it was taking way too long and that you would automatically infer that this car therefore must be huge. Now, this is one of the tricks that we still can't really explain. I'm studying this with a, pretty, with a group of about five PhD students and postdocs, and we clearly do not know how this actually really works. We know that it works. I can use it as an example, but we don't really know how it works. What do, what do we know about timing? Well, we do know that it's not unique to humans, obviously. Foxes sleep, bears catch salmon, But do animals also do this cognitive timing? And the answer to that is yes. A very elegant experiment with hummingbirds in, uh, in the forests in Canada actually shows that. Because there they had these sort of like artificial flowers that you see here. And there were two types of artificial flowers. The blue ones that replenishes every 10 minutes and the orange ones where it took 20 minutes before there was new food available. And they were just truly put out there in the woods in Canada. And they measured how long it took these natural birds to actually figure out, and whether these birds could figure out, that there was a sort of temporal sequence. And the beauty is that they really could. So here you see the visiting times of birds to these two different flowers. And on the x-axis, you see how much time has passed, and on the y-axis, you can see how many times these birds actually visited that flower at that time point. And what you can very nicely see is that there is indeed this emphasis on 10 minutes for the blue ones and on 20 minutes for the orange ones. So even hummingbirds know how to time. And we can also go to even smaller animals, because, for example, bees can also tell time and even in a more intricate way. Because if a bee has found a very potent source of food somewhere, it will fly back to the hive, and it will make all sorts of like intelligent um, flight patterns to tell the other bees how long they need to fly in a certain direction to get to the food. So not what the distance is, but how many seconds they need to fly. So that tells us that animals really can do this type of cognitive timing too. And in a way that shouldn't surprise us because a lot of the research in the 50s and the 60s on this topic too was done with animals, with pigeons. Now, humans can time, young children can time, and animals can time, but how accurate is the timing system of ours actually? So is it like a metronome that ticks very, very accurately? Now, the answer to that is you could say yes and no. We are terrible timers. If I would ask you to time one second, so you see a red dot on the screen and I would instruct you press the space bar after one second has passed. You could be as far off as two seconds or say 500 milliseconds. You'll never be off for a minute, but you will not be that accurate. But what you can see in performance is, is what, you what I plotted over here. If you just look at the moment-by-moment -moment accuracy, you're actually pretty good. So if I know that on a certain trial you took about two seconds, I know for sure that on the next trial you'll be very close to that. So your precision is relatively good compared to the, to the ones that you've just seen before. Now there's another big phenomenon in this timing world and in the general perception world, and that is that if you experience different durations, so different durations on the x-axis, and then you look how long it feels, how long these durations do feel to you, 
this would be a perfect time, or this would be a human that's like a metronome. But what we see instead is that it sort of looks like this. The short durations are perceived as longer, and the longer durations are perceived as shorter. And at first that might feel weird, because why would this actually be useful? Why would our internal system be attuned to making errors? But it actually works out really well if you assume that almost nothing in the real world is perfect. If I'm talking to another per if I'm talking to my wife, if I'm talking to another person, I need to assess how long the pause is in that person's speech. And sometimes it's longer and sometimes it's shorter. But it would be useful to sort of assess, is this more like a word-finding problem, or is this really an invitation to take over the initiative? And therefore, it's useful that if we work in a noisy environment, that we get this sort of like regression towards the mean. But our system is also inaccurate in useful ways in other settings. About 10 years ago, I was living in the United States. It was a wintry morning, and we had a very long drive to go. The roads were snowy, and I had to drive very slowly, so we were hurrying up a bit, which we probably shouldn't have done. And then there was this beautiful black bit of road. All the snow was clear. So I pressed the gas a bit more, and before I knew it, we were in a spin. And we spinned over one, our part of the highway onto the other side. There was no separator in between. And there was this huge American truck sort of like coming my way. Now, luckily, just before that truck was at our spot, we ended up in a ditch. Now, this must have took shorter than the time that it actually took me to explain to you what happened. But I can recall every moment of this near car crash. And that is because, at that moment, my internal clock started running faster and faster and faster. And that's very useful, because we know that the internal clock is also associated by, by with how quickly we can take information from the environment. So I could have very quick snapshots, and therefore, hopefully, act in the right way. But this kind of arousal-based clock manipulations can also be found in other forms of arousal, like sexual arousal. Imagine a scene, early morning, clearly after a very hot night, two people talking to each other, and one says, this was the most marvelous night that I had. It felt like, that, like I was making love for hours to you. Where sort of like the camera moves to the other person, and probably she sort of like lifts an eyebrow and thinks, <laughs> hours? 90 seconds, I think. <laughs> now, <laughs> this actually can be very nicely explained by what I just explained to you. This guy was so aroused that his clock was, go was spinning and was making over hours, and it was really going very fast. But apparently, the clock for the other person didn't go that fast. So, internal clocks can explain a lot of our behavior. But where is actually time in our brain? How do we, do we have a clock? And the answer to that is no. This is a picture of body works. This is the senses. You can see eyes, the ears, you can even see a bit of skin, but there's no clock in here. And that's right, because unlike vision and audition, there are no dedicated sensors. But still, we feel time, like the color of an apple or the timbre of a tuba. We feel that time is passing. So how does that work? Well, the idea is that time is sort of like a peripheral system. What I've plotted here, shown here, is a picture of the brain. The cortex, the higher regions, and the basal ganglia, the lower parts. And the idea is that we can map this onto some sort of like model. And I won't be going into too much detail, and I won't even be going into this detail. I'll just talk about there's something that is oscillations, and there's something that is detecting those oscillations. Now, how can we use that to figure out how much time, how time is passing? Well, the answer is relatively simple. Anything important that happens in our lives causes a change in oscillations. And let's say that every time that an oscillation has a certain height, we get an activity. This activity can then be used as pulses, but then we have the problem that we need to count many pulses. 
So instead, what we should think about is that we don't, do not have one neuron that's oscillating, but we have many neurons that are oscillating. And this way, I can now start to tell that from the onset of a particular event, if a certain duration has passed, the green and the yellow oscillator should be active. And that way, I don't need to count. Time just happens as sort of like a natural byproduct of other processing. And of course, with just five oscillations, it doesn't work. But we know that we have thousands and thousands of oscillators that are being read out by each of the detectors in the basal ganglia. So if we know that this red dashed line is the duration that we actually want to estimate, say the default duration that someone always needs to find a word in speech, we can just sort of like start our clock, take this particular duration, make sure that all the oscillators start again, and just wait until the oscillators are back in the state that we've stored. So this way, we can really explain how timing works. Not by assuming that we really have a clock inside our brain that goes faster and slower, but by assuming that time is in a way not really a peripheral system, but that time is an epiphenomenon of all other processing. Thank you for your attention.